Welcome to worship at Wild Rose United Church, where we seek to embody the uh, beloved community of Jesus through radical welcoming, progressive theology, and social justice. No matter if you grew up in the United Church of Canada or had never attended any church before this morning, it's good that you're here. No matter if you come full of optimism and joy or burdened by shame or grief or fear or anger, there is a place here for you. No matter if you come seeking answers or only wish to better understand the questions, all God's children of every color of the rainbow are embraced as sacred, treasured, and made in the image of God. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister here at Wild Rose United Church. Uh, in the sanctuary providing leadership today are uh, Karen Nell Bennett, uh, Dan Somerville, and Diane McKenzie, uh, Carol and Doug Willoughby, Eileen Hartman, uh, and, the, and the folks behind me, Navona Don McIntosh uh, and Valley Stewart. Uh, thanks also to our ushers who have uh, helped us have a mixed format service with worshipers in the pews and also to our offering counters. Wherever you are, however you're accessing this service, if you are doing so on Facebook or on YouTube, I hope you'll do us a favor and go to the comment section or chat section if you're able and let us know who you are and that you're watching. Uh, this will be both a meaningful record for us and also uh, a very useful one. Long before anyone who looked like me came to this continent from Europe or to this place uh, where the bow and the elbow meet called Mokinstis in Blackfoot and uh, Calgary in English, there were people here. Uh, people who had been here from the beginning and who had fully developed systems of economics and politics and spirituality and culture. We acknowledge their history and their presence, uh, particularly in our case the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Kainai, Pikani, and Siksika First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the three nations of the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bears, Pond, Chiniki, uh, and also Métis Nation of Alberta. We are treaty peoples, 
and we all have work to do in healing and reconciling the broken relationships of centuries. Just a couple of announcements. There will be some special uh, worship opportunities in the upcoming season of Advent. One will be uh, streamed online, and that will be a uh, celebration of uh, anthems and carols with our choir. Uh, the other will be uh, either uh, in person or, or probably a mixed service like this one today uh, on the winter solstice, December 21st. So there will be more information about uh, those services coming out in uh, community contact. So keep your eyes. And now, uh, while we uh, join in our opening song, uh, Carol is going to light our candle. Just before Doug goes on uh, with the call to worship, I neglected to acknowledge our folks in the tech booth, uh, Corinne Salajano and Bill Aitken, so uh, thanks also to them for being here and helping out today. Now Doug uh, will lead us in the call to worship. Happy are we when our misdeeds are wiped clean. Rejoice and be glad, and make your hearts new and holy. In the eye of the storm, we hear the whispers of grace. Amen. We come to worship not to see or hear, but to be seen and heard by God. Not to help ourselves, but to seek God's help and be helpful in turn. Let us open ourselves to the saving and renewing presence of the one who is always ready to listen. Let us pray. Eternal and ever-moving God, you have spoken to us through prophets and preachers of your word. Grant us that we will never take your word lightly or speak it selfishly. Send your word in all its forms to dwell with us, not just in this place today, but wherever we go and every day. Free us from all pride and deceit and everything that keeps us cut off from you or deaf to your word. Help us to join one another on journeys of trust and hope. We believe that you have called us as a community to be servants in your kingdom. Therefore, clothe us with faithfulness and joy, and let our lives honor your faith in us. Amen. The peace candle is a tradition that has spread from congregation to congregation. Uh, soon uh, we will discuss ways that we can spread this uh, outside our walls, probably when the pandemic has uh, reached a, a new point, we'll begin that conversation. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. Peace is the state that emerges in our midst when those who have much do not have too much, and those who have little do not have too little. When the very old and the very young feel supported and secure, parents can feed their children and themselves, and all have the opportunity for meaningful work in their community. As I light this candle, let us commit ourselves to pray and work for that kind of peace.
And now Dan and Karen and our choir will lead us in our hymn. I brought some things from my office to talk about today. I, I brought this before as part of my, my toolbox, my toolkit. But this is, uh, of course, a hammer. And uh, I brought with it a nail. I have nails in my office because on Good Friday, we remember that nails were used uh, to torture Jesus. But that's not why I brought it today. That's just why I have it in my office. This is, this is one kind of hammer. I wonder if, if you can think of other kinds of hammers that maybe you've seen or heard about. There are some that are much bigger than this. This one isn't very big at all. Uh, there are hammers like this one that weigh three times as much. This one has a, a, a claw on the back. Do you know what that's for? That's for if you want to take a nail out of something and if it's, a, if it's a small nail, you can use this hammer. Uh, I was taught as a child, I don't know if anyone else here was taught this, uh, you don't use a wooden handled hammer um, to pull out nails, or at least not, not bigger ones or stubborn ones, because the wooden handle can break when you do that. We use hammers for all sorts of things. When I grew up uh, on the farm, we used hammers and nails like this one, to build things. We also used hammers like this one to take things apart by, by pulling out nails or by, by hitting things with the blunt end of the hammer until they came apart. A, 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 a hammer gives you a certain amount of power. You can do things with a hammer in your hand that you can't do with just your hands. It even... Uh, we learn about this in, in, in elementary school, don't we? It makes your arm a little bit longer so that not only does it have a hard, a hard tip, but you can hit harder with the handle than you could even just, just holding something hard because it makes, your, it makes it longer. You can 
create a lot of things with a hammer, and you can destroy a lot of things with a hammer. And I think that's kind of the same with any kind of power. Any kind of power that a person has, whether it's the strength of their arms or the strength of their words or the strength of the decisions that they're able to make that affect other people. You can build a lot of things and you can destroy a lot of things. Growing up on the farm, sometimes in addition to using hammers to build things or to take things apart, we might use them just to smash things, just for demolition. Where you're not trying to take something apart nicely, you're, you're just trying to knock it down. Sometimes on a farm you have to do that. An old building has to get knocked down. This isn't a very good hammer for that, but I'll tell you what, they make some hammers out there that are very good for knocking things down. Every one of us has a certain amount of power. A certain amount of strength, whether it's in our, in our arms or in our words or in our choices. We might not feel like we have very much power compared to other people around us, but we still have some. I wonder if you could think about what kinds of power you have. Maybe even if, uh, even if we're very small, there are still people who are smaller than we are. Right? Even if, if I'm not uh, always very strong physically myself because sometimes my body hurts a lot and I have to tell my kids that I, I can't play with them or I can't pick them up because my body hurts so much. But even then, I still have more power physically in my body than some people do. Or maybe it's the things we can say or the things we can say without words, the things we can say with gestures and actions and, and a look on our face. Or it's the choices that we can make. And with all of those kinds of power, we get to decide whether we're going to build something with it, take something apart with it, or demolish something with it. Holding that kind of power is a big responsibility. So I hope we can all think about and, uh, and decide that we're going to use our power as much as we can to build something good and to take apart things that are ready to be taken apart, and never, ever, ever to use the power that we have to destroy something good or to demolish another person or their feelings. Thank you so much for listening today, and uh, Eileen is going to read scripture for us. Today's reading is from Ruth 2, 1 to 16. Now Naomi had a respected relative by marriage, a Hebrew of means from the family of Elimelech. That person's name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let us go to the field so that I may glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose eyes I might find favor. Naomi replied, go my daughter. So Ruth went. 
and on arriving, Ruth gleaned in the field behind the harvesters. By chance, it happened to the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz, who was from the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and said to the harvesters, May the Holy One be with you. And they said, May the Holy One bless you. Boaz said to the young overseer, the one who was supervising the harvesters, To whom does this young woman belong? The young overseer who was supervising the harvesters answered, This is a young Moabite woman, the one who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab, who said, Please let me glean so that I might gather grain from among the bundles behind the harvesters. That woman has been on her feet from morning until now and has sat down for only a moment. Boaz said to Ruth, can you hear me, my daughter? Don't go glean in another field. Don't go anywhere else. Instead, stay here with my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that they are harvesting and go along after them. I've ordered the young men not to assault you. Whenever you are thirsty, go to the jugs and drink from what the workers have filled, have fought, have filled. Then Ruth bowed down, face to the ground, and replied, How is that I found favor in your eyes that you notice me? I'm an immigrant. Boaz responded, Everything that you did for your mother-in-law after your husband's death has been reported, reported fully to me. How you left behind your parents, your family, and the land of your birth and came to a people you hadn't known beforehand. May the Holy One reward you for your deed. May you receive a rich reward from the Holy One, the God of Israel, under whose wings you come to seek refuge. Ruth said, I hope I continue to find favor in your eyes, honored one, because you've comforted me and because you've spoken kindly to your servant, even though I'm not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, come over here, eat some of the bread, and dip your piece in the vinegar. Ruth sat alongside the harvesters and received roasted grain from Boaz. Ruth ate, was satisfied, and had leftovers. Then Ruth got up to glean. Boaz ordered the young men, let this one glean between the bundles and don't humiliate her. Also, pull out some of the bales for her and leave them behind for gleaning and don't speak harshly to her. Scripture is our song for the journey. God calls us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I haven't uh, been part of farm work for uh, uh, about 20 years or more. But I do know that farming has changed since the time of Boaz and Ruth. When I uh, was working on the farm, my job during the harvest was driving the combine harvester. For those who are unfamiliar, what happens with the combine is that it, it uh, brings in the plants from the field, it separates out the seeds from the rest of the plant material, it uh, holds on to the seeds, and it ejects the rest of the material out the back. And uh, my father, who was the farmer, had a particular thing that he would do when I was driving the combine. It's something all farmers do, or at least they should. He would come along and he would throw a tray. It might be, uh, sometimes it was a uh, uh, the lid from a, from a steel granary, a round steel lid. Sometimes it was an old frying pan. Sometimes it might be a flat hubcap. Uh, but he would throw it under the machine as it was running. And all the material that was ejected out the back would get ejected onto this tray. And then he could come along, pick up the tray, and look through, and he could see how many seeds per square foot were being ejected out the back of the machine. Because you want your machine to be adjusted properly so that not too many seeds are blowing out the back and not too much plant material is getting saved 
along with the seeds. You can't have it perfect. Because if, if zero seeds are blowing out the back, that means too much plant material is going in to the, the hopper part. And if you have zero plant material going into the hopper part, that means too many seeds are blowing out the back. So it's a question of getting the settings to a point where it's acceptable. Now much has changed in farming, but that part hasn't changed. The techniques in the time of Boaz and Ruth would be very different. You would have uh, uh, people with uh, sickles, grabbing bundles of grain, cutting them with the sickle, laying them aside. Other people coming along, picking up the bundles or the handfuls and tying them together. And there would always be some heads of grain dropped in that process. There would always be some plants that were uh, bent over close to the ground that didn't get grabbed with the sickle. And people like Ruth, who had no wherewithal of their own, traditionally, could come along behind the harvesters and pick up what they could manage to find. For Boaz's uh, workers to collect every seed would take too much effort. Because there would be diminishing returns with the amount of effort. Boaz is concerned with feeding his household, feeding his, his flocks, paying his workers. And so there's a calculation of how much loss is acceptable. Now, if your workers are efficient and diligent, perhaps they're better than others at grabbing every stalk of grain, cutting every stalk of grain, stacking every stalk of grain. In fact, the law in the Old Testament, in our Old Testament, pardon me, the law in our Old Testament, whether it was ever followed to the letter or not, says that you are not to harvest all the way to the edges of your field. You are to leave some good grain growing in the verges. For people like Ruth and Naomi. Boaz goes above and beyond. He doesn't just let Ruth gather behind the people. He tells her, stay in my field. I've ordered the young men in my employ not to harass or humiliate you. This should give us some idea of the risks posed to a young woman gleaning in the fields. A young woman gleaning in the fields, by definition, has no one to protect her. If she is the one doing the gleaning, it means she has no father, no husband, no grown son. to shield her from predatory men. Boaz says, if you're thirsty, come and drink. At mealtime, he welcomes her to the meal, does not only give her bread, but includes her in the distribution of the roasted fresh grain that has been picked that day.
and speaks to her directly. The start of our story today, Ruth says to Naomi, if you remember, if you were uh, uh, part of the service last week, we spoke about how Ruth and Naomi came to be in Bethlehem. Naomi was uh, an emigrant from Bethlehem to the land of Moab, where her sons, her Hebrew sons, married women of Moab. And then her husband, her sons, all died, and she set off on the road to return to Bethlehem as a penniless widow because it was the only prospect she had. But her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, she sent back to their family homes because she did not see any prospects for them if they continued along with her. Orpah obeyed and returned to her family home and Ruth, for reasons of her own, chose to stay with Naomi and not abandon her. That's how they came to be in Bethlehem. And at the start of our story today, Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going to go and glean in the fields in the hope, and I I wonder if you caught these, these words, in the hope that I may find someone's favor. In other words, in the hope that perhaps someone will hire me into their household as a servant, Or perhaps even I might find a young man who may, for reasons of his own, be interested in a widow from Moab. As the story carries on in chapters 3 and 4, Naomi and Ruth hatch a plan. They hatch a plan to to get Ruth into Boaz's household. Boaz is a relative of Naomi's husband. As such, he has some, he bears some responsibility for his familial connections. In chapter 4, he goes to the, uh, uh, to the marketplace, to the, the gates of the city, and negotiates with the next of kin. He is not next of kin, but he is a wealthy relative. Perhaps we can read into the story that he is the wealthiest relative. The next of kin agrees that... Uh, Everything that was Elimelech shall, be Boaz, shall belong to Boaz, that he gives up his right as, to redeem as next of kin because he doesn't have the means. So Boaz inherits all that was Elimelech, including caring for Naomi and Ruth. It's through Boaz and Ruth that uh, Naomi has a grandson. It's through Boaz and Ruth that the story of this family carries on. Boaz, throughout the entire story, does everything a proper, upstanding Hebrew is supposed to do. In today's story, when he arrives at the fields, he greets his workers by saying, may the Holy One be with you. That is not a meaningless detail. Another person may arrive at the field and greet his workers by saying, how's the harvest? May arrive at the field and greet his workers by saying, is anyone slacking off? may arrive at the field and greet the workers by accusing them of not working hard enough or by accusing them of stealing from him or by pressuring them. Boaz greets them by saying, may the Holy One be with you. And they respond by saying, may the Holy One bless you. At every stage Boaz is the ideal wealthy man.
I don't know what we would have done in my childhood. I don't know what my father would have done if a neighbor had come and said, my family is hungry. And there are seeds being flung into your field behind your equipment. A little bit different. The seeds being flung into the field behind our equipment were much, much harder to find than the ones that Ruth was picking up. But if someone had come and said, can my family on our hands and knees Pick up what grain we can find. I think it would have been difficult for us to see that. I actually think it might have been more likely that we would say, We'll give you the amount you can gather in order to not have to see you on your hands and knees picking up the grains one at a time. But I don't know. The question at the heart of the laws that Boaz obeys, the laws of allowing others to glean. Boaz, you may have noticed in today's story, in addition to allowing Ruth to glean behind the workers, instructs them to pull some stems out of the bundles to be less efficient. to make sure that she would benefit from her efforts. And the laws that Boaz follows in chapter 4, where he uh, follows the proper rules to redeem the inheritance of Elimelech, they have to do with who deserves... to be included in economic activities, included in social activities, included in human dignity. And that's why I think, when I imagine back to my childhood, I think we as farmers would have been uncomfortable with the notion of gleaning the way we farmed. Because of the implications for human dignity. That a person is reduced to stooping on the ground and picking up what has been left behind by others. We don't have this dynamic in farming today. We have, uh, as we uh, noted in worship a few weeks ago, we have the Canadian Food Grains Bank where farmers uh, have come together in order to uh, provide food for the world and also to provide uh, uh, agricultural knowledge and, and support for local agriculture across the world. Farmers supporting human dignity with their knowledge and their work and their, the fruits of their work. We have conversations about who should deserve to benefit from 
public programs. Debates in the, in the United States, but also here, about what should be covered by uh, health insurance. about who should be covered by health insurance. About who should have, who should be awarded the dignity of not having to beg to have their eye health and their oral health cared for. Debates uh, here in Canada about, um, uh, in my mind, it's called uh, uh, guaranteed basic income. Uh, I, I think the, the going term now is universal guaranteed income. I, I'm, uh, there are different terms for it. Thank you, Claude. The idea that we all benefit if none of us are utterly without. Countered by the notion that some people deserve the dignity of social support while other people uh, do not. Debates around why, when, uh, when the economy was on, uh, when the, uh, uh, the stability of the economy was on the brink in the, in the pandemic, why the uh, basic supporting income was set at $2,000, when people who are on uh, uh, assisted income for the severely handicapped or AISH, uh, are getting less than half that amount. Discussions about how in order to qualify for social assistance, you have to debase yourself. Those of us who are, uh, who are disabled, Uh, and I include myself in that, in that uh, population. Those of us who are disabled have spent our entire lives trying to hide our limitations. Trying to convince ourselves that it's not that bad. And then when the time comes that we are unable to work and we need assistance, we have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are more disabled than other people. When the evidence isn't there because we have become so skilled at hiding the level of our struggle. Who is entitled to human dignity? The, the laws that Boaz follows, whether they were ever fully applied, fully followed or not, Boaz follows them in the story and they are presenting a vision a vision of a world in which we understand that as a people, not only as a community or as a society, but as a species now, 
given what is happening in our world, given the impacts of changing climate, given the uh, impacts of, uh, um, uh, of global manufacturing, given the impacts of uh, uh, rapid communication around the world, as a species, we are as vulnerable as the least vulnerable among us. We are sold this fantasy we are sold an idea that with wealth comes security. That while others may be vulnerable those of us who have pensions or savings or holdings are secure. And can therefore, to some degree or other, neglect what is happening elsewhere or happening to others. I had a conversation with someone uh, who I won't name because uh, I don't have, I, I haven't asked her permission to share this. Um, but it, uh, it's a person from Banff. When I was the minister there, we had this conversation. For four years, I commuted from Canmore to Banff. For four years, I watched as the pine forests between Canmore and Banff have steadily turned from green to red. It's a transformation that I saw driving through British Columbia for the uh, 10 years prior to that. It's a transformation caused by an invasive species called the, uh, uh, the mountain pine beetle. It's a beetle whose uh, life cycle is supposed to be controlled by winter freezes. And because of rising temperatures in the uh, Canadian mount, uh, Western Mountains, the pine beetles are multiplying and they are destroying the pine forests. And there are vast portions of British Columbia where the pine forests have not only been destroyed, but the new growth pine that is growing up in the, uh, uh, in the wake of the destruction is now also being destroyed. And I watched it for four years happening on my commute. And we were talking about climate change. This was around the time when I believe there were uh, floods in Australia and just a year before that there had been fires in Australia. Or even, maybe even six months before that there had been fires in Australia. And there were storms happening somewhere and, and I said, she said, isn't it terrible? And I said, yes, it's, it's terrible that uh, these things are going to keep happening. And we saw it this week uh, in British Columbia. These things are going to keep happening. And she said, well, things like this have always happened. And I said, yes, they have, but not all at the same time. Not four and five at a time around the world. And she said, well, at least it's not happening here. And I said, it is happening here. The pine forests are dying. And if we think that somehow we are safe, that we're safe from the flooding because we live in the prairies, that we're safe from, the, uh, from hurricanes, that we're safe from forest fires because, because we don't live near the ocean, because we, we don't uh, uh, have uh, vast forests, we saw the grass fires that swept across the prairie. And we will see vast migrations of humankind as coastlines change their shape and cities become differently inhabitable. Now, I don't have an answer. I don't, I don't uh, beyond uh, uh, hitting targets to keep uh, warming at one and a half degrees or whatever it is they're talking about now, 
Beyond that, I don't have an answer for how we do this in our lives. Because if every single one of us reduced our carbon footprint, 80% uh, or 70% of the carbon would still be entering the atmosphere because of industrial activity. So I don't have, I don't have an answer about what we can do in our lives day to day. But I, I do know, whether it's about the impact of all these global changes, or whether it's about the inclusion of uh, gay and trans and uh, lesbian and bisexual and uh, uh, non-binary and intersex people, or whether it's about caring for those who are uh, unable to generate their own income. Giving them access. Whether it's about accepting restrictions on ourselves during the pandemic in order to care for the safety of everyone around us. I do know that our Bible has a vision. A vision where the question of who deserves human dignity is always answered. that it is those who are most vulnerable who should be awarded human dignity. That if we are to ask, how do we make ourselves less vulnerable to economic instability or less vulnerable to uh, disease or less vulnerable to um, uh, social unrest, the answer is always by acknowledging that we are all as vulnerable as the least vulnerable among us. That trying to use wealth or privilege or power to protect myself from the very people that I am supposed to be supporting and caring for is moving us in the wrong direction. Boaz is very much a fairy tale character. This story is written close to a thousand years after it's set. Six, seven hundred years after it's setting. Boaz is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible or anywhere else in human literature. Boaz is a fairy tale figure. As the wealthy man who does everything that is expected of him. Next week we're moving on from this part of the Bible, so I'm going to share with you the ending of the book of Ruth. The very ending of the book of Ruth, Ruth is that Boaz and Ruth give, have, have a child named Obed, and, and we're told uh, Naomi raises Obed, and everyone celebrates that she has a grandchild, and Obed becomes the father of Jesse of Bethlehem, and Jesse of Bethlehem becomes the father of King David. And it's not only that Boaz did what was expected of him that leads to this chain of descent that leads to the great cultural figure of King David. But it is 
that Boaz sees Ruth, the most vulnerable person imaginable, a childless widow, an immigrant, a young woman, on her own, and affords her the human dignity that every person deserves. Thanks be to God. Karen and Dan and the others will lead us in another hymn. pray together in community. The concerns of each of us are shared by all of us. Uh, we have a weekly prayer email that is uh, sent out on Fridays. If you would like to be part of that to see the specific prayer concerns of our community, you can uh, request at the office to be included. If you have a prayer request that you would like to share in that uh, circulation, you can email pastoralcare at wildroseunited.ca. And today in our uh, Regional Council prayer cycle, we are uh, remembering the people and ministries of Northminster United Church here in Northwest Calgary. And in our World Council of Churches prayer cycle, we are praying for the people and churches of East Timor, Indonesia, and the Philippines. God of power and love, you raised Jesus from death to life resplendent in glory with a word for all of creation. Free the world to rejoice in your peace, to glory in your justness, and to live in your love. And then all that has divided us will merge, and then compassion will be wedded to power, and then softness will enter a world that is harsh and unkind, and then all will become gentle and then all will become strong. And then no person will be subject to another's will. And then all will be rich and free and varied. And then the greed of some will give way to the needs of many. And then all will share with equity in the earth's abundance. And then all will care for the sick and the weak and the old. And then all will nourish the young. And then all will live in harmony with each other and the earth. And then everywhere will be called Eden once again. Unite all humankind in the love that was shown by Jesus Christ, your anointed, 
the grace and peace that we know through the Holy Spirit and the power and justice that we see embodied by the one God forever and ever. Amen. We gather these in all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now on the screen and also available on the website are all of the ways that we can continue the ongoing ministries of Wild Rose United Church. Our offering is an act of both faith and worship. We worship God by dedicating the first portion of our wealth as a gift, and we trust that our act of offering will be a blessing in our lives and in God's world. And as we contemplate the offering, uh, it, do we have a recording, Corinne? Yes. We have a, a recording of a, a, a musical offering. Yes. From Dan and Eileen.
Let us pray. Loving God, all that we do and all we are is not enough to express our gratitude and our trust. We are asked to be ready to give up everything. For today, we offer these gifts to further your activity in the world, and we offer ourselves as your living creations to shine forth your love wherever we go. Uh, and actually, before we move on to the opening song, I'm going to skip things around because I'm going to do the blessing and I'm going to let, uh, let the musicians uh, close out the service. Uh, so uh, here's our moment of blessing. Now may the grace of Christ, our beloved, attend you, the love of God, our creator, surround you, and our companion, the Holy Spirit, keep you today and always, all our relations. <laughs>